Hey everybody, Steve Joy here. Uh, today, I want to just go over something that I said I was going to talk about before. And just a full disclaimer, uh, some people probably aren't going to like this video because I have a lot of speculation in it. And uh, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not trained in that kind of stuff at all. But these are sort of hypotheses that I've built up after reading a book. Uh, I can't really say the title because YouTube will lose its mind. But, uh, <laughs> which we'll get to in a minute. But anyway, uh, so this book I was reading, I was reading the section about uh, Ivan uh, Petrovich Pavlov, who is a scientist, psychologist, that did experiments with dogs, and you may have heard of him before. It's the whole drooling dog. You give them a treat and ring a bell, and the dog can salivate, and then eventually just ringing the bell will have the dog salivate. So it turns out there's a lot more to this than I even uh, than I knew because I had I had looked at it before uh, Pavlov, and uh, what what I understood was that this is something that dogs did. I didn't quite understand that this is something that people do. So where I got into speculating is I started thinking about how this relates to games, how Pavlov relates to games, and that's when I got the idea. Uh, let's invite Pavlov to the game table and see if he can explain some of the things that I've seen going on at the game table. So again, I'm not a psychologist. I, I know nothing about this. This is just going off of what I've read and what I know about Pavlov, but my experiences with games and how this might relate to the games. So here we go. A hypothesis here. Right. So we have to uh, first first off, I should cover some of the things that I've learned that sort of caused me to think about this. OK, so the uh, first thing is that people respond much better than dogs do to uh, conditioning, which is what Pavlov calls when you ring the bell and give a give a human a treat. Humans are really programmed to do that. We we learn Pavlovian responses really quickly and we use them all the time in our social interactions with people like at the game table for example so uh this is this is how we it's part of our it's part of how we interact with other people it's part of how we learn how how to respond to our environment as we learn these pavlovian responses <clears throat> and so the thing is, is that Pavlovian responses are quite a bit different than learning. If you sit down with a book and you study rules, that's different because you're actually trying to take the root, the the information itself, and put it into your mind so that you can retain it and then you can express it later or use that information later. With a Pavlovian response, it's learned at a sort of uh, subconscious level. You don't realize that you're learning it. And this is something that makes it so interesting to me in terms of games. And it turns out that we probably learn Pavlovian responses a lot faster than we learn, you know, traditional learning, how we think sitting down in a class. Uh, so, and then the more that, that our, that stimulus, that, that we find that, you know, uh, uh, a stimulus happens and we have a negative response to it or a positive response to it, we learn our conditioning even faster, okay? And we learn this conditioning from other people as well. When we interact with other people, we learn how they react, if they react negatively, if they react positively to how we interact with them, we get a Pavlovian response. Now, this is a physical reaction too. So this, is, this makes it a little bit different, in my opinion, to learning just because we learn it at an actual physical level. And, you know, this, that ex this explains to me why, I hate to say this, but I can actually have a, an awful reaction to some people. It has happened to me in the past, and I'm certain it's happened to everybody. You just have, you know, somebody that you just really can't stand. I think that's why. I think it would be because you've learned something, some kind of response to them. It just triggers in you a physical response that you don't like. That would be my speculation at any rate. I don't know that to be true. It's just what I suspect off of what I've read. read. But these, lear these learned behaviors, humans can learn them really fast, but humans can also 
drop them really quickly. Although that happens at different speeds. Some humans forget them faster, others learn them sooner. And then also some people learn Pavlovian responses or their Pavlovian responses from negative stimuli, that is getting punishment. Some people learn from positive uh, stimuli, that's like getting rewards. So in terms of a game, uh, the games, because they're supposed to be fun, we think in terms of giving rewards to players to try and encourage certain behavior or encourage them to play in a certain way, perhaps uh, bonuses for uh, playing their alignment well or bonuses, you know, that sort of thing. But I think also just as important is negative responses or negative, negative uh, 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 interactions as well for some players because some players aren't going to respond to that. Some players, it's just right over their head. They're not going to care about the rewards. And I've seen that before. That's certainly the truth. Uh, I, so so I, I can concur with him <laughs> on that level. Anyway, at, from the gaming table. Uh, uh, let me see here. All right. So one thing that conditions humans extremely well, we're really, really conditioned easily by it, is language. So what we're allowed to talk about, what we're not allowed to talk about, the words we're allowed to use, the words we're not allowed to use, really set up conditioning. Now this book, I'll go over it again if you want to read it. Can't recommend it enough. It's amazing. So this book is, is not really talking about games at all. It's talking about totalitarian uh, regimes and how they use, uh, 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 what would you say, uh, censorship to curb people's minds and condition them into a certain way of thinking. Because if you're only allowed to talk about certain things in certain ways, then it conditions your, it, it gives a Pavlovian conditioning so that people can only think and behave in certain ways. And so that's sort of the, the, uh, uh, idea behind it. And for example, I wouldn't be able to say the title of this book in a YouTube video without it getting flagged. You know, go figure. So but it is what it is. You can draw your own conclusions. One quote that I really like from the book, I can't pronounce the guy's name, so you'd have to look it up if you want to know who said it, but was a man is like a rabbit, you catch him by the ears. I love that, right? So it's probably some nasty person. I have no idea. Some some totalitarian, you know, person. This is a very heavy book. So what it got me thinking about, and my speculation here, and the reason I, I'm thinking of it is because I used to play poker a lot. Love poker. And one of the things I noticed playing poker is that when you sit down at the table, there's an atmosphere. There's a certain... Uh, quality to every single table that's different from the time before. And I've never quite understood that. And I always thought if I could put my finger on that, I would get a real advantage. Now, I did get an advantage. There's no way around it by observing it and very carefully looking at each player and understanding how are they responding to the conditions at the table right now. Because... If I could understand that, I could gain an advantage and win some money, right? Who doesn't like to win money? And I, yeah, you know, I, I was pretty good at poker. So I used this. And so my speculation here is that what I was actually looking at, because you could have the same people one week and at the next week, like one week the table would be really tight and everybody's playing their cards really close to their chest and they're not betting that much. And then a few hours later they loosen up and then they tighten up again. It's very interesting. And then the next week, same people, you're playing poker and they're really loose at the start and whatever. So my hypothesis now is that what it is, is people are learning Pavlovian responses. So it's not as much cognitive thinking as we'd like to think. They're having physical and emotional reactions to the other people at the table. Now, where this applies to role-playing games is that I find the same thing applies to role-playing groups. Is that every role-playing group has a certain uh, atmosphere to it, if you like, and also has a certain... Uh, culture that that 
other groups wouldn't necessarily have. And no group is the same. They all, they're all different. And they can have different times. Like you can get people together and they'll have a certain way of interacting one night. You get them together for a new game, they have a reaction a different night. So what I'm suggesting here is that if you... Now this would be sort of next level DMing trick. But by inviting Pavlov to the table... If you start watching carefully, like I used to watch people at the poker table, if you watch your players carefully at the gaming table, you can start to discern whether they respond more to positive stimuli or negative stimuli. You can understand, you can sort of see how they're reacting to each other. So a very good uh, explanation of this that I would say, it, or that, that I would that I would use is how I really abhor having toxic people at my game table. Uh, I actually got rid of my uh, a game group a couple years back, a few years back, because there was an incredibly toxic person at the game table who managed to destroy my entire game, started up a new game, invited me to the game. It was just mind-numbingly toxic. Like, I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, and so I tried for a little while, and finally I was just, to hell with it, I can't do it. And the reason that I don't like that is because when you've got a toxic personality like that, everybody is learning how to tiptoe around that person, how to respond to them. Same if you've got a rules lawyer. A rules lawyer, that's negative. What they're doing is they're teaching you as a DM to watch everything you're saying, to watch how you do things, to be very worried about the rules. They basically... By conditioning you as a GM to watch every word, to watch every rule, to be careful of everything you're saying, they're destroying your ability to be a good GM or a good DM. They're destroying it. Get them out. Or talk to them. Talk to them. Right? You can talk to them and say, hey, look, this, roy this uh, rules lawyering, I like the rules, they're nice, but I play the game my way. Sometimes I just don't use the rules, sometimes I ignore them. If you don't like that, you're free to leave. But if you can live with that, then it's great. But I do not want to be conditioned by your constant insisting on rules, bringing them up, arguing with me, that kind of behavior. Very toxic to the table. And now I think, my hypothesis is, I understand why. Because what's happening is you're learning how to respond to that person in a Pavlovian way. You're actually having a physical reaction. It's physically changing your mind as to how you can think and what you can come up with, how creative you can be, what rules you can use. Can you imagine? I mean, it's, it's way more toxic than I had any idea. That's my hypothesis. And likewise, other things that people may bring to the table that are toxic behaviors that you as a GM may not like. They, you have to be, or you, my suggestion is, because like I say, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist, nothing like that. This is just from my experiences as a GM. You have to be cognizant, cognizant. You have to be mindful. <laughs> you have to be mindful <laughs> of the players and how they're conditioning you you have to be mindful of the players and how they're conditioning other people around the table. Because they are conditioning them, and it creates the atmosphere of the game. So if you, can, if you can stop negative, if you can stop people from influencing the game negatively, Pavlovian negative responses. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. My daughter played D&D. She really enjoyed it. This incredibly toxic person came over to my house and played a game, and my daughter played in the game. My daughter hates D&D now. I mean, it's... Can you imagine? She doesn't like it at all. She doesn't want anything to do with it. It's directly because of him. It, it was his... His toxic behavior that caused her to not like D&D. I mean, think about that for a minute. She, it, he conditioned her to physically not like the game. Now, that's heavy. I mean, this is my daughter. This was horrible. This is one of the reasons. I was like, all right, this, this has to stop. I'm done with this. So, 
that's an example. It can actually be strong enough to create because that's what it does, creates physical. And you're not learning it on purpose. That's a really important thing. This is sort of through osmosis, if you like. It's just through interaction we learn these things. So it's sort of, it's sort of how I would characterize the atmosphere at the table comes about. And I think if we're aware of it, I think if we're conscious of it and we're actively watching, then we can ensure the people at the table playing and we as DMs ourselves, because we also have to enjoy the game, I think we can ensure that we can. And I think it's a good idea. Like if you if you read this book or something else about Pavlov, you can get an understanding, I think, of just how bad this kind of stuff is at the game table, how destructive it is. Incredibly destructive. Anyway, uh, that is my video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll subscribe and all that uh, stuff. Leave likes and uh, thumbs up and all that stuff. And thanks for watching. Until next time, I'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye.